So bringing our gifts before the Lord, we come with an attitude of gratitude. We recognize that we might not have what the neighbor has. We might not have what that person we, we saw in the magazine has. But we have abundant blessing from a God who loves us. A God who gave us Jesus to pay for our sins. And so we come with that attitude of gratitude. We give these gifts. We yield them. We turn them over. We take no further control upon them. We give them to God to use as he sees fits. And part of that giving is we give ourselves. We give who we are. We give our personalities. We give our creative abilities. We give our energy. We give our time. This is our offering. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for the many ways in which you've blessed us. The ways in which you have shown your love to us and poured out that love upon us, that love that overflows. And Lord, from that love, allow us to bring these gifts humbly, cheerfully, enthusiastically, with expectation, excitement about how you might use these things, how you might use us to continue to share the wonderful words of life, the words of Jesus, the words of, of truth, the, the words of, of beauty and power, of mercy and grace. Use these gifts, Lord, to continue to share your word with a world that needs to hear you. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn, Like a River Glorious. If you're using a hymn book from Scotch Plains Baptist, hymn number 592. Um, otherwise, it's in your worship packet. If you're not getting that worship packet in your email, uh, let us know here at the church. We'll try to get that. I know that I've had uh, some bad email addresses. Somebody's been getting worship packets from the church, um, uh, and they have no idea why. Uh, but you're not getting yours. Just contact us. Let us know your correct email address. We'll get that out to you. Like a river glorious. <laughs>
when I'm picking hymns, I, I try to read through them to make sure that they're fitting my feel. Maybe it doesn't reach you, but my feel for where the service is on that particular day. Um, and actually, the third uh, verse had a line in there that I was thinking, wow, there, there's probably generations that kind of have to think, what does that mean? Traced upon our dial by the sun of love. Um, <laughs> it's talking about a sundial and, and movement and seeing where God is, where the sun of love is. Um, and it, it reminded me of, I recently saw something about a, a young mother whose daughter asked her, why did you tell me to hang up my phone? Um, well, you used to hang the receiver up on the old dial phones, and we don't do that quite the same way with our cell phones. So language does change, the imagery does change. And there's an image in that hymn that I don't know that I've had ever paused for before. Um, there's the line that um, uh, talks about not a surge of worry, not a shade of care. And that makes perfect sense. But then there's an expression that comes next that I don't know that I have seen anywhere else, not a blast of hurry. And it doesn't quite seem to fit. I mean, you think about, you know, worry, you think about having cares, but a blast of hurry. And then it, it just, it's like a, a blast in my mind, a, a flash. This idea of a blast of hurry, that's a different kind of worry, isn't it? You know, I gotta, I gotta hurry, I gotta get this done. There's, there's a deadline, I, I, I got too many things to do. But not a blast of hurry touched the spirit there. And then maybe that's also part of that blessing that we don't have to hurry, and when we can let go of worry, let go of care, let go of that blast of hurry, I'm loving that phrase, we can get to that finding, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. As we go to prayer together, I don't know where you need to find peace. As we, as we go to our pastor prayer, I don't know where you need to find rest. I don't know where your worry is, where your care is. I don't know what's, what hurry is blasting you to get done. As we go to prayer, I encourage you to find peace and rest in Jesus Christ. Let's pray here. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for the things you have done, the things you are doing, and the things you are yet to do. We thank you for the way that you have continued to be in our life to bring us perfect peace. Not a, a temporary calmness, not a, a peace like the world thinks of, but a peace in you, a perfect peace. We thank you. Most of all, you brought us peace from our temple. You brought us relief from what we had earned in our sin. You brought us reward when we had only been thinking about the fine, the consequence. Thank you. Knowing what you've done, knowing who you are, we bring before you our concerns. Oh, we've got we've got loved ones who are are grieving. We mourn for our losses, and we recognize we mourn not only for our loss through death, but our loss through separation, our loss through broken relationship. We bring to you our our grief over. Headlines. We see so much anger and fear. So much blaming of the other. So much confusion. So much loss. We bring these things to you. Because we know that we can get caught up in them. That we can feel that surge of worry. We can feel that shade of care. We want your peace. We don't turn our back on the world. We don't deny what's going on. But we seek the source of peace. We seek to proclaim love. Mercy. We seek to exercise gentleness. Kindness. We want to bring those things to bear 
on the problems under our roofs, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our country, in this world. So Father, we, we worry about jobs and we, we ask for your peace. We stress about paying bills. We stay awake at night thinking about that next doctor's appointment or the next visit with the specialist and what they might tell us. But Lord, we turn to you and we listen for your voice, for your reassurance. In you, we find peace find our rest. Together, may this be our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the things that I've become more and more convinced of, the longer I do like what I'm doing right now, is that I'm not a good preacher. I understand that. Um, maybe, a, maybe I'm adequate. Maybe I'm, as my father would say, fair to Midland. Um, but nobody's going to be buying my sermon series. You know, nobody's going to be looking for me to publish a book. I just speak the truth as the Spirit speaks through me. And I rely on the Holy Spirit interpreting it as truth for you. And I recognize that there's not a whole lot of folks who go throughout the week quoting my sermons. And I'm okay with that. Um, and, and one of the reasons I can take comfort in that, in, in trusting God to do God's thing and I just do what He asks me to do, is when I read like our text today, um, when, when we read it, I want you to notice um, that there's a, a, a part where Jesus sits down and teaches the people. It's the preaching part, if you will, or the reflection or the homily or the message or whatever title you want to put on it. It's the time where he was talking about this is what God wants you to hear. And when we read that in our text, when we get the notice, we're not told what he said. I mean, isn't that incredible? That Luke, as he's passing on this passage, as he's, as he's sharing it with us, as he's relaying this story to us, he doesn't tell us what the teacher taught. Now, I don't know if it's because nobody can remember exactly what he said. I don't know if it's they didn't remember his anecdote, they didn't remember the joke he told, they didn't remember his alliteration, they didn't remember his three points, whatever. I don't know. But we see lives changed, not in the words of the message, but in what surrounds that message. And that gives me hope. It gives me hope that I don't have to be perfect. It gives me hope that I don't always have to get to a sermon without getting tongue-tied at some point. It gives me hope that I don't have to be overly concerned about a list that can distract people. Or that I might confuse a reference at some point. It gives me hope that God gets His work done. Maybe in spite of me if not at least through me. And see, that's an encouragement. Because I, let's be honest, if you think you can be critical about my sermons, I can be critical about my sermons. But then I have to realize, again, it's not about me. I'm called not to be perfect, but to give my best. To be sincere in what I'm doing, to be in prayer and thought about how what God is speaking to me, how I can speak 
that to you and allow the Spirit to do the work upon you. It's an encouragement as we read this. We're getting this from Luke chapter 5, uh, beginning with verse 1. Uh, I'm going to read nine, uh, nine, 11 verses of it. See, I already got messed up. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and caught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked all, all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled the boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Now I'm going to guess that for many of you, this is not a new scripture. That you have heard it. That you've heard it repeatedly. If you're part of the Scotch Plains Baptist Church family over the years, you've heard me use this same text. I'm going to guess that some of you as we were doing that, we're singing a little song about, I will make you fishers of men. I'm betting some of you were thinking about uh, how many times you've heard the story, the miraculous catch of fish. It's a familiar story. And because it's familiar, sometimes it's hard to share that again, looking for an epiphany. Looking for what is the new revelation here? What new light can we shine on this? And i got to tell you where my thinking has been. My thinking has been on probably the second most the main character. Not, not Jesus, but Simon, who we know gets to be called Peter. And Simon in this. And not so much Simon at the end. And I gotta tell you, that's typically where we're gonna go. I'm gonna go to Simon being called to become a fisher of men, and that, that call of the first disciples, and that, that call on the great fishermen, and the setting the stage for evangelism around the world, even to today, that we are fishers of men, that we cast a net, and we might not grab every fish out of the sea, but we get some. That's where I want to go. That's where my mind goes. And that's maybe where you go with that text because that's where we've gone so many times before. But I want to take another look at Simon in a different light. And again, this whole calling of these first disciples, we have to remember, it's not just told one way. Um, and, and, and we've done this before as part of the church family where we've looked at uh, from the different Gospels and the different references to Peter and, and how this all came about. And th this might be a particular snapshot or it might be a frame out of a film, but there's a lot of context around it. What I want to look at is here is Simon. After a long night working, and they're wrapping up the work day. They're packing up the tools. They're getting everything ready. And I, let's face it, that's, a, that's an impressive thing about a workman because I, there have been some sloppy workmen and at the end of the day they just do everything in the truck and worry about it later. Or they're like me, they shove it all into a five gallon bucket and put it aside and they all, all come back to that. Well, here at the end of the day, they're taking care of the equipment, getting it ready for the next night's work. And here comes Jesus. And the crowd's gathering and he's talking. And I'm guessing he's close enough that those cleaning these nets can hear what's going on. But more and more people come. And I can picture Jesus kind of getting pushed back by the crowd and moving closer and closer to the water. And finally kind of looks up over his shoulder and sees the boat, sees Simon and says, let's, let's, let's use your boat. 
Let's, let's move on out. And so they do. They get in the boat, um, and it moves out a little bit from the shore. Okay, that makes practical sense. That way I can move away from the crowd, and if I'm not in the boat, they can't keep pushing. They're, they're kind of stopped by the water's edge, and my voice can be heard. And he sits down in the boat, and he teaches the people. And that sitting down kind of throws me in a little bit. But remember, this is, we just talked about it. Jesus in the synagogue. That he stood up and he read from the scroll of Isaiah, and then he sat down and began to teach them. See, the, the rabbi sat to teach. And so he sits down, and he taught the people. And we don't hear what he said. Luke here does not record the words of Jesus in the message, in the, the main thing, the entree, if you will. When he finished, he said, Simon put out in the deep water, let down the nets for a catch. And Simon kind of questions him. We worked all our night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And I'm kind of drawn to that. I don't want to, but because you say so, I will. Do you ever find yourself in that position? I don't want to. I've already tried. I've done this. I've done that. Don't, don't ask me to. But we see a little bit of that attitude previously. Up in verse 3, when he saw the boat wanted to go out, he, the, the long time, he asked him to put out a little from shore. Now, I'm betting then that Simon was thinking, you know, I've been on that boat all night. We just got it cleaned up. We just got it set for the next shift. But he did it anyway. And now, he says, because you say so, I'll do it anyway. And so they did, and they caught the fish, and that's the miracle story, and there's some, some great stuff in there. And we see the response, and we jump down to verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Now, he had been hearing the things of Jesus. I'm guessing he had heard right there on the shore as the crowd was getting bigger, as they were prepping their, their work equipment. Certainly, while he's sitting in the boat and the boat's just sitting offshore a little bit, there's no, no sailing to do. I am sure that he sat and he had, he had the best seat in the house to hear the things of Jesus. And even after hearing that kind of questions, why are we going out to deep water. We're, we're done. We're tired. Why are we going out to deep water where we didn't catch anything anyway? But because you say so, I will do it. And then this miracle of the fish, and all of a sudden, Peter is overwhelmed. Because he sees in Jesus not just a teacher, not just a rabbi, but because of that miracle, he understands a little bit. He said, go away from me. I am a sinful man. Go away from me, not because of your great power, and I'm powerless. Not go away from me because I am scared of what you can do. But he has seen something in Jesus that allows him to see his sin in himself. It turns the lens on him. And he recognizes his sinfulness. And in recognizing his sinfulness, he recognizes that he shouldn't be in the presence of this man. Go away from me. See, he and all his companions were astonished. And if we know anything about Peter, we know he often was speaking the things that other people were thinking. There's, a, at least in my mind, a, a pretty good guess that the rest of them are feeling the same way. That the weight of their sin was on them. I can't be here. I 
shouldn't be with you. And I think, I think that in our humanness, in our most basic, maybe it's not so much you're too holy for me to be here. I'm too sinful. Maybe it's just I'm kind of comfortable in my sin and you're making me uncomfortable. I'd rather not talk about these things. I'd rather not think about these things. I just like going on how I was. If you keep talking like this and keep doing things like this, I might be convicted and want to change. I wonder how many of us, when we came to Christ, we went through a series of those kind of conversations, those thoughts of, you know what, ignorance is bliss. I felt better when nobody was highlighting the things I'm doing. It's kind of like when you're getting that second piece of cake and somebody's giving you the look. It's not, go away, I don't deserve to be in your presence because you eat so healthily. It's more like, go away, don't, don't worry about what I'm doing. Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. And then, I'm going to make you fishes of men. Don't be afraid. What was he, what was he asking Simon not to be afraid of? It could be, don't be afraid that I'm doing these miracles and I'm going to catch you and get you there. Aha, now I'm zapped. I mean, that could be a don't be afraid of that. It could be, don't be afraid that you, you can't be in my presence, that I'm so holy that, that you can't be here. And that maybe it would be kind of like um, Raiders of the Lost Ark and opening that ark and the spirit coming out and blasting everybody, you know. Don't, don't be, maybe, maybe that's what it is, but I, I'm thinking it's more along the lines of don't be afraid to have your sin revealed. Because I'm here. I know it's I'm here that's causing your sin to be revealed, but because I'm here, don't fear. Because in me, there's a remedy. It doesn't have to be this way. You don't have to run and hide in the dark because of your sin. The light can expose it and I can deal with it for you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what's going to come next. And then Jesus calls him, from now on, you will fish for people. And Jesus is reassuring him that I know your sin and I'm calling you anyway. Yes, you are a sinful man, Simon. You, you're right. And you have no right to be in my presence, but I call you anyway. And don't be afraid of that. See, I think a lot of us have that I'm not worthy. Don't look at me. Go away. Let me keep my sin to myself. And we need to hear Jesus say to us, don't be afraid of this. Trust me. I'm calling you. There's a meme post that keeps floating around on the socials. And it's this idea that it's expressed in a couple different ways, but the, the general idea is when God called you, he already knew how stupid you are. And he called you anyway. And this should be reassuring. I believe God called me into his ministry and he knows and he knew about my list he knew I had a tendency to have my brain run faster than my tongue get tongue-tied. 
He knew that I wasn't the best storyteller. That I wasn't fond of five dollar theological words. And he called me anyway. Saying, don't be afraid. I've sat in on a lot of ministers talking about their journey, particularly towards ordination, their, their call to ministry. And the theme that is the most consistent in that is they ran from the call to begin with. They heard it, and they went a different way. And I think they needed to hear, don't be afraid. I am calling. Yes, you feel like you're unworthy. I am calling you. Yes, you feel like you don't have the gifts. It's okay. I am calling you. Yes, you might have gifts to fish for fish, but I'm going to take those gifts and use them in a different area. Don't be afraid. I am calling you. A couple of years ago, there was a song that if you, if you listen to the, the local Christian radio or maybe have a Christian radio on the, the satellite in your car or whatever, that you might be familiar with. It was sung um, by Lauren Daigle. It's called You Say. You Say. Very simple title. Um, huge success. Uh, number one on tons of different Christian radio streams. Um, uh, it won a Grammy for the best contemporary Christian performance. Um, what we got in 2019 was top Christian song for Billboard Music Awards. Um, it hit the charts, uh, the, the Billboard Hot 100 charts, it made it on there, which is kind of impressive for what we would call Christian contemporary music. Um, on the Christian song charts, it hit in 2018. It ultimately ended up 132 weeks at number one, now not consecutively. So it would be on for a couple of weeks and then off and something else would take number one, but then it would come back. And come back. A 132 weeks, it was the number one song on Billboard's Christian song chart. Three of those times that it came back on and knocked the song off, it knocked off one of her own songs and it hit number one. There's something about this idea that this song kept coming back. That need for the words of it, of you said. Um, it was the first song to spend a hundred weeks at number one on Billboard. The Billboard has lots of different charts. So when somebody says, oh, well, it, it hit the Billboard, you've got to find out what chart. But they have a hot chart, which is um, a, a genre span. It covers rock and hard rock and alternative and country and hip hop. It covers dance, electric, gospel, Latin. You say it was the first song that's been 100 weeks at number one on that multi-genre chart. Something about this song spoke to people. <clears throat> it ranked number 50 on Billboard's end of the decade digital song chart. It um, peaked at number five on Billboard's all adult top. 40 chart. It was certified uh, just about a year ago, quadruple platinum. You Say by Lauren Daigle. Let me spell Daigle for you. D-A-I-G-L D-A-I-G-L-E You Say. Look it up. Watch the video. Oh, tremendous video, by the way. Hear these words. And boy, I wish I could sing it for you, because just reading it doesn't do it justice. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Wow. I think that line right there is what gets it up to number one. Because I think just about every person who has ever listened to music has had that voice in their head at some point. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. If there's a universal theme to our, our 
our mental health. It's this, that we've got inside us something saying, you're not enough. You're not good enough. I think this is what Simon was hearing when he's on the boat. He's heard Jesus preach on the shore. He's heard Jesus preach in the boat. But now they pull up that catch of fish and he hears, you're not worthy. And he says, go away from me. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't you listen to that. that tells me I will never measure up. See, Lauren Day, as she wrote this, and she's one of three co-writers, as she wrote this, she probably recognized in her own story those voices that said you're not enough, that you're not going to measure up. Maybe even the voices outside of her head. Maybe somebody somewhere along the line that she auditioned for something and she didn't get. Maybe... I don't know. Maybe she tried for the, the lead in Oklahoma and she ended up being in the chorus and she, she got, I, I, I'll never be a star. I'll never get the spotlight. I don't know. I don't know if she failed a ninth grade geometry test and the teacher made her feel dumb. I don't know if she had a boyfriend that broke up with her and crushed her. I don't know if her grandfather made a comment about her athletic skills. I don't know if her grandmother made a comment about her makeup. But I bet as she wrote this, she started to think of every single lie that told her she would not measure up. So that I am more than just the sum of every high and every low. Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. In writing the song, yeah, there's voices that tell me I'm not enough. There's lies that tell me I won't measure up. But I know I'm more than all that. And I need to hear again. Once again, I need to hear. And the chorus the chorus as she sings back to Jesus. You say, I am loved when I can't feel it. Then. See, there's voices and there's lies. There's the work of the devil. There's the work of people who are out to get you. There are the work of people who are jealous. There are people who are angry, who are bitter. They're going to lash out no matter what. And they're seeking to tear me down. But you say, I am loved. I need to hear that. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I am hell when I am falling apart and I just need to be hell. I'm coming unraveled and it's just, it's just falling everywhere and you pick it up and you hold me tight. You let me know of your presence. You let me know of your perfect peace and rest. And when I don't belong, oh, you say, I am yours. I might not fit in with them. I might not fit in with them. I not, might not fit in with them. They might not like me. He might reject me. She might yell at me. But in you, I belong. And I believe. Oh, I believe. What you say of me, I believe. And man, if that don't preach... I don't know what will. This is what Peter was going through on that boat when he was ready to jump in the water and swim away to get away from that one. I'm not worthy. And Jesus looks at him and says, do not be afraid. From now on, I call you. Peter, you are mine. I have a plan for you. And when the world starts beating up on you, when the devil starts coming to you in the middle of the night saying, you're not good enough, you're not worthy, listen.
listen to me because I say I love you. Yes, I know who you are. Yes, I know what you've done. Yes, I know every dark thought you have. And I love you. And you feel weak and broken. I'm strong. And I can pick up those broken pieces and I can hold it all together. And the songwriter says, I believe a lie. Believe what you say of me, I believe. Next verse goes on. The only thing that matters now is everything you think of me. In you, I find my worth. In you, I find my identity. It's in Jesus that we can give up our sinful identity. That we can give up our identity of, of failure, of weakness, of not measuring up. And for those of you that are thinking you're riding pretty high, we can recognize that in Jesus our identity is not in our income, not in our job title, not in the size of our house, or how shiny our new car is. That our identity is in Him, and in Him we are enough. He loves us and He calls us. He knows how stupid we are when He calls us and He calls us anyway because He loves us and we can trust that in Him. He can call into our lives right now. Do not be afraid. You think you can't go on. You think you can't take that next hurdle. You think you can't deal with what's around the bend. I am with you and I called you to me. Do not be afraid. Another verse, taking all I have, and now I'm laying it at your feet. You have every failure, God. You have every victory. That even the good stuff, I tell you because you make it something better. I can bring my bronze, and you're going to turn it into silver. I can bring my silver, and you're going to turn it into gold. And I leave that gold with you. And I'll wait for what you have. We don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be a great preacher. I don't have to have three points in a poem. I just need to hear God say that I'm loved, that I'm strong. to sing along with Lauren Daigle and I believe oh I believe what you say of me I believe it's that belief that takes us to this table it's this, this table reminds us that we are sinners <laughs> that like, like Simon we stand and say I'm a sinful man but I've heard Jesus call me by name and say, you're not stuck there. I'm taking that away. I'm taking away the sin that leads to death and I'm giving you life. And we gather at this table because we believe. It might not make sense. It might not seem fair. It might not be logical. It might seem too simple. But when we come to this table, we come saying, I believe. I believe that when Jesus took the bread and he blessed it, and he said, this is my body broken for you, that he meant for Chaz Hutchison. And when he said, do this in remembrance of me, he didn't mean do a ritual. But believe in me. Do this because I love you. When we come to the table and we lift the cup, we do this saying, I believe. I believe that in fact, Jesus was the lamb. That he was the sacrifice. 
that his blood is the only thing by which I may be saved. I believe that Jesus died to take away my sin and give me life. I believe as I do this. And as we walk from our service, whether it's in the sanctuary at Scotch Plains Baptist Church, whether it's at the kitchen table or it's sitting on the couch in the living room, as we walk from here, our very steps proclaim, I believe. Jesus goes with me. He's called me by name. He's told me, don't be afraid of any of this. Don't be afraid of those voices. Don't listen to them. I love you, and I call you. As we walk out, we hear those words, and we say, I love you. Let's pray for Holy God. Thank you. Thank you for what you have done for us through Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you have done for us as a body, as a multiple, as a congregation. What you've done for us as the church throughout the centuries. But Lord, thank you for what you have done for me personally. <coughs> that you have called me by name. That you have seen my sin. That you've heard every voice calling out to me. Every voice trying to get my attention. Every voice trying to drag me down. And you called them liars. And you called me to yourself. Thank you. Thank you for your love. I believe. Amen. And so we come to our hymn. Hymn number 596 if you're using one of our hymnals. Otherwise it's right there in your worship packet. Simple words. Leaning safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on the everlasting arms, let's sing together. 596 if you're using it.
can't do a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I am held when I'm falling short. And when I don't belong, oh, you say I am yours. And I believe. Oh, I believe. What you say of me, I believe. Go now. In the name of Jesus Christ, who has called you by name, who says that you are loved, that you are strong, that you are held, go in his name, be a blessing, and may you know that you are blessed. Amen.